Hello and welcome to Offensive Golang Bonanza. Uh, I'm Ben. Uh, hi, DEFCON29. Uh, we're going to talk about Golang Malware. A little bit about myself. Uh, my first DEFCON talk was at DEFCON13. Uh, I'm the host of a hacker-themed podcast where we interview a lot of people around this community. Uh, very in-depth, very technical. Uh, please check that out. Um, and I have a bunch of random projects on GitHub. Uh, so what this talk is going to be, there's two ways to consume it. One, you can just listen to me describe a whole bunch of Golang malware components, and you'll get a sense of what's out there, what's available, what's possible. Um, and if you want to go in-depth, uh, there are links on all of the slides to uh, the actual code repos themselves, uh, code samples, uh, interviews, news articles, all kinds of stuff. So to start with, uh, I'm going to do a, a, a little bit of backstory on my, uh, my, my hacker crew and a little bit on Golang and why it's so interesting to malware developers. Uh, and then we'll start going through uh, various components and tools. So in the beginning, uh, I was interested in uh, anti-censorship uh, surrounding a, a particular Iranian election. Uh, I was uh, taking a look at the Tor obfuscation proxy, obsproxy2 at the time. And uh, I thought I could do better, uh, and so I started the RatNet project, uh, which is a pretty cool uh, uh, NIDS evasion thing we're going to talk about later. Uh, and I was using that project as an excuse to learn Golang. And what I learned is that Golang is magic. Uh, unlike any programming language I've used before, you, you just anything you, you need, anything you would normally have to install as a, as a separate uh, library or utility is just there for you. Everything from uh, crypto networking libraries, uh, virtual file systems are supported natively, which is totally unique. Uh, the compiler cross compiles easily to every other uh, architecture and operating system. Uh, there's built in uh, test frameworks, uh, vendoring frameworks. Uh, it's garbage collected. It has a very efficient uh, thread implementation and it has its own assembler. Um, and the, the third party li library support is totally unparalleled. Uh, so Rust is years away, uh, just to answer the question of why don't I rewrite everything in Rust. Uh, but the main reason that I love Go is that it is the fastest way to be done. And my goal is not to reinvent every wheel. My goal is to, when I start a project is to be done with the project and use the project. Um, and the, the fastest way to learn Go, the way I learned, is a document called Effective Go on the Golang website, which assumes that you already know how to program and just tells you what's different about Go. Uh, I would highly recommend that uh, to anyone who wants to learn Go, especially if you already know how to program. So a few relevant facts about Go. It is not interpreted. I'm not sure why people seem to get that misconception. It is statically compiled. However, um, it also, every Go binary includes a, a, a kind of monolithic uh, runtime, uh, which is like 800K uh, on most operating systems. So that's a, it's a bit of overhead per binary. Uh, and then all of your code is statically compiled uh, on top of that, all the dependencies and everything that aren't already in the runtime. The, uh, the embedded assembly language is based on Plan 9's assembly language, so it's a little bit crazy. Um, we don't have time to go into it, uh, but I did a, a write-up uh, that will kind of help you cope. Uh, it's linked on this slide. I recommend checking that out. Uh, so to get into the story, uh, so Stuxnet happened, and everyone got very hot on environmental keying, uh, environmentally keyed payloads. Uh, Josh Pitts made a tool in Golang uh, to do environmentally key payload, keyed payloads called Ebola. It got very popular with the red teamers at the time. And so uh, all the EDRs and AV companies wanted to write SIGs for Ebola, uh, but they had never seen a Golang uh, uh, hacker tool before. And so they all ended up uh, writing signatures for the Golang runtime, which is included in every Golang process. Uh, so what happened next is that all of the AV utilities triggered on every Go binary, including the installer. Um, but it also included the very prevalent uh, orchestration tools, you know, Docker and Terraform. And so as a result, they all had to pull those SIGs very quickly uh, because, you know, people need their Terraform. Um, and this is a, uh, a pattern that malware developers look for. Uh, we call the jar to exe pattern, 
where basically if you have anything that makes a native um, binary for you, uh, but it's uh, it has one legitimate user, that means the AV companies need to whitelist it. And they have trouble creating SIGs for like Java inside a JAR 2 exe uh, uh, binary. They have trouble creating SIGs for Python inside a Py to exe uh, binary if those are whitelisted. And similarly, they have trouble creating SIGs uh, for Go code, which is statically compiled past the Go runtime. Uh, so realizing that, and also I, I had, had this sweet exfiltration library I'd been working on called RatNet, um, I started uh, talking to other uh, security people that were uh, interested in Go, and we got together, shared ideas, things escalated very quickly, um, and uh, we... Uh, you know, this has happened in the past with uh, Python, now it's happening with Go. Um, and we made uh, a bit of a community. Um, probably the best uh, example of this is there's a particular uh, Slack server uh, uh, where Pound Golang, the Slack channel, um, has like literally, uh, I, it's like the best place on the internet. It has like all all the people uh, working in um, Golang malware basically hang out there. They share ideas. They're really nice to each other. Um, there's no kind of like political or weird other internet nonsense. It's just people you know helping each other with projects, suggesting project ideas, um, and it's uh, it's just amazing. Uh, so we're going to talk about tools from a lot of people in this chat room. Um, I, bold, I bold faced the, uh, the, the ones that are specifically mentioned in this deck, but uh, everybody in there, uh, just thank you. It's been, uh, totally, uh, critical for my sanity, uh, especially over the last year. Um, and I especially want to thank, uh, the, the community organizer, Jeff McJunkin for keeping most of the crazy out. Um, so, uh, just a quick word about, you know, offense and defense, all of these tools are open source. Uh, we, we post the code. We hope that the people who work on operating system uh, and uh, defenses and defensive tools will study these and learn how they can um, improve. Um, uh, some of the, uh, the, the problems that especially the bypass tools uh, exploit have been around for 10, 20, in some cases, 30 years. Um, so having uh, you know, it, it, there's no, it, it's not O-Day. It's just like, you know, things have been broken for a long time. Uh, you can't just bury your head in the sand. Um, so we're trying to make things better by helping people understand how things actually work. Um, and on that note, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about what tools exist for reversing Go binaries. Uh, there aren't a lot that are useful. Uh, even now, uh, the most useful one is probably the Go Reversing Toolkit. They have a tool called Redress, um, which is fairly successful at extracting metadata from stripped Go binaries, uh, including dependencies and compiler versions. And then there's a few uh, IDA scripts and blog posts uh, uh, linked on this slide, uh, which give you some clues as to uh, how to go about reversing a Go binary, but it's, it's, it's still pretty primitive. And I think a lot of the trouble is that is the static compilation aspect. If you've ever tried to uh, open up an embedded uh, you know, C program that's statically compiled in IDA, you end up having to sort of manually work out what a lot of the functions do. There are kind of uh, flirt flare signatures, but I haven't, um, I haven't seen that for Golang yet. Um, so some of the core components uh, for the rest of the tools we're gonna talk about. Uh, the first one, the one that gets used by almost everything uh, is our, our fork of Go standard debug library. So Go comes with a, uh, a library called debug that parses uh, all binary formats, PE uh, for Windows, ELF, Linux, uh, and Mach O for OS X. Um, we forked that, uh, fixed a bunch of bugs, um, and added uh, support for uh, editing the file, changing things by their fields, you know, and, uh, and then writing the file back out uh, once you've changed it. Um, so uh, we, we turned it into an arbitrary binary modification framework. Uh, and we also made it, uh, parse files that are already loaded into memory. And also you can, uh, write them back out to memory, but you need a, a tool we're going to talk about later. Um, but this is especially cool because you can parse your own process, uh, which lets you do a lot of neat malware tricks, um, uh, as we'll see. And uh, you can also inject shellcode into um, a, a file on disk, which is also pretty handy. Um, 
so the the parser entry points uh, for you know PEL from Mako are always either new file or new file from memory. Um, the generator entry points are always called bytes uh, in case you're looking at the code. Um, also, some of the stuff we added, uh, we added base relocations and relocations. Uh, we added uh, import address table fixups, uh, the ability to add sections, uh, the ability to hook entry points, uh, and the ability to uh, access and add signatures, uh, which comes up in a lot of the, uh, the malware tools we're using. But this might be useful for other things as well. Um, another core component is CPPGO. Uh, we got this from Lauren Siegel. Uh, we just forked it and added uh, support for uh, the Apple M1 for ARM64. Um, basically, this is a way uh, from Go to make native calls into uh, any other library using any ABI, any calling convention. Uh, so it comes with standard call, uh, CDECL, and this call. Uh, and so this is absolutely critical uh, for a, a, a lot of uh, malware functionality from Go. I'd highly recommend you check it out. It's a great example of Go Assembler. Uh, moving on to the exploitation tools category. Uh, our first exploitation tool um, is called Binjection. And this uses the, uh, the, the Binject debug uh, binary modification platform uh, and adds a layer on top of it, which implements a variety of different algorithms for inserting shellcode. Uh, into a binary, predominantly hooking the entry point, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be. So there's a command line utility. You can also use it as a library. Um, and so uh, it's very extensible, uh, and we've implemented a, a variety of algorithms, um, uh, including uh, for PE, the one we use the most often these days is just adding a new section. You hook the entry point to point at the new section. At the, at, at the end of the new section, you have it point back to the original entry point. Um, so basically, file starts, runs your shell code, and the new section jumps back to the original entry point. Um, uh, modern PEs don't have a lot of uh, code cave space anymore. I guess there have been compiler improvements. Uh, so this is the most successful method for PE uh, we found. For ELF, we have a variety of different methods. Uh, we're probably going to add more. We have Silvio Cesari's original uh, padding infection method, uh, which we updated a little bit so it supports uh, position-independent executables. Um, and uh, we also, uh, Sblip uh, from the channel, uh, also implemented a completely new uh, injection method based on PT note, uh, which is in there. And um, we also have uh, uh, CTORs or constructor hooking for shared libraries. So not only can you hook an executable, you can also inject shellcode into a shared library and have that run when the library loads. Uh, for Mach O, we're predominantly hooking the entry point and using the one giant uh, code cave, which is in all Mako binaries before that first load segment. Um, I'm not uh, sure why that is always the case, but it, there's always one giant code cave you can fit a bunch of show code in. I don't know. Uh, just a quick example of what the code looks like. Uh, this is the whole uh, uh, Silvio uh, method uh, uh, from Binjection. Uh, there are no there's no weird offsets. There's no hex math. Uh, you can just read it, and it's referring to the actual fields uh, in in the file format, uh, and that's the, coming from Binject Debug. Uh, and this is the right layer of abstraction that you want to code um, injection algorithms in, uh, and that's uh, kind of the whole point. So it, it's easy to, to understand the algorithm just by reading the code. It's easy to add new algorithms. Um, now, what kind of kicked off the Binject Debug and Binjection project was a desire to make the old uh, tool from Josh Pitt's Backdoor Factory work again. So Backdoor Factory stopped working, and we were like, hey, let's just rewrite this whole thing and go. We broke it into modules, and we ended up with Binject the Bug Binjection. And finally, we needed to close the loop with uh, Backdoor Factory. Um, so Backdoor Factory is a thing, uh, man in the middle, uh, someone who's trying to download a binary and injects shellcode into the binary automatically. It was beautiful. Red teamers loved it. It got used all the time, and then it stopped working, and we were all very sad. Um, uh, Backdoor Factory uh, originally worked with a tool called Ettercap, which is terrible and old. Um, I mean, it worked at, at the time, but it was a, it curses. And there's a better Go rewrite called Bettercap, uh, which adds support for more um, man-in-the-middle methods. Uh, and uh, so we decided to use Bettercap for the rewrite. And then we already had Binjection, you know. Uh, so uh, basically... Uh, Bettercap has a scripting language called uh, Caplet Scripts, and they already had implemented a script uh, for Bettercap called Download Autopone, 
uh, which intercepts uh, web downloads and replaces them with a malicious payload. Uh, so it doesn't inject it into a file, it just replaces it entirely. Um, but we just started from that. And then in the caplet language only exposes uh, read file and write file commands. That's the only way you can interact with anything outside of JavaScript. Uh, and so uh, we figure uh, we'll just make a named pipe server and uh, and use read file and write file to pass the file being man in the middle to out to binjection, inject our shell code, and then uh, use a read file to read it back in through another pipe uh, back into the caplet and uh, return it to the user. Um, so that looks like this. So you can use better cap to man in the middle uh, someone's download using uh, ARP spoofing, DNS poisoning, DHCP v6, or anything else better cap supports. Uh, that their download request comes to you. You go out to the server they were originally trying to access and download the file they were trying to get. And then you pass that file through the new pipe server, the new backdoor factory to Binjection where the shellcode gets injected um, into the executables. And then um, the whole thing gets repackaged and passed back uh, to the user and they think it was the file they were trying to download. Uh, open it, run it, run your shellcode. That's the general idea. So our implementation of Backdoor Factory, uh, you know, is, lives in uh, Binject. Um, basically what it does, it starts up this pipe server. It spits out the caplet and uh, bettercap config files uh, that you need. And it tells you exactly what bettercap command to run, um, which is just mainly because I've kept forgetting how to use bettercap. Um, it, it, you may need to customize that caplet file and the bettercap config. Uh, you'll have to customize the caplet if you want to support uh, different user agents, uh, uh, if you only want to trigger on certain user agents, you can do that very regular expression. Or if you only want to trigger on certain file exten extensions, uh, you can also edit that in the caplet. Also by default, it will do um, ARP spoofing. That might be too loud. If you want to do DNS poisoning, um, you'll, you'll have to ed edit the default uh, better cap config that comes out of there. Um, so some features that we added, we added support for unpacking archives. Uh, so it'll actually, uh, if someone's trying to download a TGZ or a zip file, it will unzip that on the fly, inject all of the binaries inside it, then rezip it and pass it back to the user. Uh, we're also working on adding support uh, for re-signing the binary with a stolen or purchased uh, key. Um, and uh, we'll have a word on that in a sec. Um, and uh, we also ported this to the Wi-Fi Pineapple because back in the day, running uh, Backdoor Factory on a malicious access point was super fun. And Golang uh, supports easy cross-compilation to MIPS32. Uh, so there are links to the BetterCap and Backdoor Factory packages we made uh, on this slide. Um, so quick demo. Uh, so on the right, uh, we're downloading uh, a file with wget and uh, unzipping it, running it, and it says, I'm a simple program, blah, blah, blah. Now in the upper left, we're starting the pipe server, uh, which opens up some named pipes to uh, Binjection. Uh, and it gave us, it generated some better cap configs, gives us the command to run better cap in another window. We run better cap and it starts the ARP spoof and intercepting files uh, using our caplet. Um, so we go and download the same file we just downloaded again. You can see the size is a little bit different. Unzip that, run the binary inside, and uh, you can see it printed test in addition to the uh, the original command, uh, the original output. That is a shellcode we made uh, that we use as a test uh, shellcode, which uh, prints test. So that's a uh, proof that our shellcode has been injected and also the original program still ran. Um, so that's the new backdoor factory. Um, so because the files are being passed in uh, by a pipe, we actually don't, we lose the extension of the file on the way in. Um, we don't get that through the pipe. Um, so we're actually using uh, MIME. So we're, we're using a Go library to determine the MIME type. Uh, and then we're, we have this switch statement based on the MIME type, uh, what uh, injection to do. Like that's how we figure out what file it is. So if you want to extend it, uh, you can just extend it by MIME type, which is actually pretty awesome. Um, you know, there's different MIME types for like jars than zips, which is pretty cool because uh, some programs would tell you they're the same format. Um, and uh, the the main uh, call to Binjection looks like this inside Backdoor Factory. It's injective binary. It does a quick um, check of the magic number to see if it's a mock O, ELF, or PE. Um, 
and then it uh, calls, uh, it pulls the appropriate shell code and then calls uh, binject uh, near the bottom there um, uh, to inject the appropriate shell code uh, into the binary. So uh, signing from Golang uh, is also very well supported. Uh, the two main libraries uh, I'd recommend that you check out, uh, one is called Limelighter, which uh, uh, it does authentic code signing of EXEs and DLLs. Uh, uh, it, you can either use a real cert uh, or it'll make one up for you, uh, which is also kind of handy for EDR evasion. Uh, and another one that's a little bit heavier, but signs everything is Relic. And uh, Relic uh, not only does the authentic code signing stuff, uh, it also supports like CentOS RPMs, uh, Debian uh, deb files, Java jar files, uh, Silverlight zap files, uh, which is pretty handy if you can still find some Silverlight, um, uh, PowerScript, uh, Android APKs, and Macos and DMGs for, uh, for Macs. Uh, so there's a lot of possibilities for uh, extending uh, Backdoor Factory to new and interesting file formats. So moving on to a different exploitation tool, uh, from CISTO, we have GoWMI Exec, which actually brings the ability to just do remote uh, uh, WMI, Windows Management Interface calls, uh, to Go, uh, which lets you just run random shell commands on uh, some target Windows machine out in space. There's also another library that gives you full SMB support, um, uh, Go SMB2. And uh, so if you put those two together, you can replicate Impacket's SMB Exec functionality uh, so you can you can upload a file uh, with Go SMB uh, to a target, and then you can execute it with uh, Go WMI Exec. So you could put this in your implant and have it like auto spread, um, or you can use this as an initial inject, uh, assuming you have um, creds for a Windows box. Um, and so in code, it's kind of just as easy as this. I couldn't fit uh, all of the uh, the file upload stuff in there. Um, but you can see the uh, the WMI call. Uh, basically, you just you pass it username, password, uh, or you can use a hash uh, if you have it, because um, CISTO is magic. Um, and uh, like the domain and the client name and stuff, you can either randomize those or they're optional. Um, so it's it's you know it's pretty easy to use. Um, and for a full example of uh, SMB exec and Go, including the, the file upload stuff, check out the source code bundle on the DEF CON media server uh, for my DEF CON 29 workshop, writing Golang malware. Uh, and there's a lot more detail in, in, um, in the workshop slides. So some other exploitation tools uh, I don't have time to go into, uh, but GoFish is a very popular phishing toolkit. Uh, um, GoBuster uh, is, is good for brute forcing subdomains. Uh, there's a little uh, DNS server you can use for XXEs. Uh, it's also good for DNS black holing, which is good for Android reversing. Um, and there's also Modlichka, which is a phishing reverse proxy, which has some novel uh, 2FA bypass stuff in it. Um, so that those are all uh, Go repos uh, you should check out or use as a reference. Moving on to EDR and NIDS evasion tools. Uh, the most important one is Garble. This is the state-of-the-art uh, Golang obfuscator. It does not do control flow obfuscation, uh, unfortunately, but hopefully that's coming. Um, but it will strip out almost all uh, Go metadata, uh, and with the, the optional dash literals command, it will replace string literals with uh, lambdas, uh, which is uh, very important for avoiding SIGs. Um, and uh, obfuscate was a bit broken. Um, it... Uh, uh, it was slow. It didn't work with Go modules. It, did, it had trouble with dependencies. Garble fixes all of that. It's actually remarkably fast. It's incredibly easy to use. Um, and I haven't, uh, I haven't seen it choke on anything at all yet, which is, which is amazing. So there's really no reason not to use Garble on everything, um, as far as I know. Um, and uh, definitely try that redress tool. Uh, try redress on something before you garble it, and then try it after you garble it and see what happens. Uh, that's probably a good time. So uh, in terms of NIDS evasion, uh, there, uh, there's a lot of kind of network code uh, out there. Uh, my own project is RATNET. Um, it works, uh, it has a couple of unique features. Uh, it works on store and forward. So it actually is not stream based. It bundles messages up into batches uh, and each message is individually end to end encrypted, but the batches are also uh, encrypted separately for every hop. Uh, it works on mesh routing, so every RATNET node acts as a router. 
Um, and uh, it also supports pluggable transports. You can have different transports between hops. You can also support multiple transports at once. Um, and you can dynamically change between transports. So the transports that we ship with, we have UDP, TLS, HTTPS, which is like cloud fronting. Uh, and we also have DNS and AWS S3 as a transport, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, and uh, I, I, this also works uh, without the internet as just a mesh routing middleware. And I'm working on a handheld RatNet based uh, hardware device, uh, which will come out as a crowd supply next year. Uh, so watch this space for that. So a couple of use cases um, that we support with RatNet. One is uh, say you've hit a bunch of machines uh, with an implant uh, and you uh, not all of them have direct internet access and you want to pivot, uh, you want uh, to, be, to be able to talk to all of the implants uh, from your, your C2. Um, so what you can do is you can make an implant where the implants find each other using uh, MDNS or multicast. Uh, and, uh, if they can't get to the internet directly, they will, uh, just automatically route, uh, all of their messages out through, uh, one of their peers. And if, if any one of those peers can find their way out to the internet, to the C2, um, you can actually, it'll just automatically make a network and you can talk to all of the implants, uh, because the implants in the middle will automatically act as a router because that's how rat networks. Um, so there's actually a demo of this working also in the workshop source code. Uh, the other use case that we want to support is if you drop an implant into an egress proxy data center. Uh, so if all web traffic or, or like all, almost all traffic is blocked uh, out to the open internet uh, from where you are, um, you can still usually get out with DNS because the local DNS server will helpfully uh, pass uh, lookups out through recursion. Um, so that's why the, uh, that's what the DNS transport is for. Uh, you also might find yourself in a situation where lots of things are blocked, but some things are whitelisted. And in those situations, typically uh, AWS is whitelisted because almost everything is using AWS at least a little bit. Uh, so there's a lot of other RatNet, uh, sorry, there's a lot of other Golang uh, tunnels and proxies uh, to look at other than RatNet. Um, so some of the popular ones are Chashel and Chisel. Uh, which got used together in a ransomware attack very recently. There's a link in this to a very uh, interesting breakdown of some ransomware that used those two. Um, and there's also uh, uh, WireGuard is a distributed VPN, which is actually a commercial product, which is uh, uh, implemented in Go and very worth checking out. It's a lot easier to set up than OpenVPN, just in general. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of other tunnel and proxy code in Go because Go is typ typically very stable. Um, uh, probably more a result of the, the built-in testing framework than anything else, but uh, there's a lot of good network stuff in Go. Moving on to uh, e another EDR evasion tool, uh, there's Pandora's Box. So I mentioned that Golang uh, has native support for virtual file systems. That means that anytime in Go you're referring to a file, um, you can totally control the file abstraction. It doesn't really have to go to the file system. Um, you can make a, uh, for example, an encrypted in-memory virtual file system and use it exactly the same way from your Go code that you talk to normal files. And that is what Pandora's box does. It basically uh, is a shim between the MemGuard library, which tries as hard as it possibly can to give you a secure enclave in memory uh, to protect uh, what you're putting in a MemGuarded region from tools like volatility or other uh, analysis tools. Um, and uh, so basically Pandora's box is the bridge between uh, the Golang file abstraction and uh, MemGuard. Um, but it gives you a, an encrypted VFS uh, very, very uh, easily. Uh, I, definitely worth checking out. Um, so this is another one of my tools. Uh, I call it the universal loader. Um, I, I implemented reflective DLL loading in Golang for all platforms. Uh, including the, the Apple M M1, so it actually works with uh, ARM64. Um, this might be the first loader I've seen anywhere that actually supports the M1. Um, although other than that, it's, bas it's doing a lot of sort of traditional reflective DLL loading stuff. Um, so reflective DLL loading basically mimics the behavior of the, the system loader when it loads a dynamic library into a process. Uh, it just does all the things the system loader does as best it can. Um, so it loads a library into the process, lets you call functions that were in the library. 
Um, but doing it reflectively means that you never need to touch disk, which is the main advantage. Um, if you never touch disk, maybe AV never triggers. Um, you know, da, 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 da. Uh, so uh, the uh, the backends uh, for the universal loader for Windows, OS X, and Linux are a little bit different. Uh, the the Windows method uh, does not use the system loader. Um, it does use some Go assembly uh, to uh, walk the PEB and uh, figure out, um, uh, and then it uses Binject debug to like parse the process you're in and like figure out um, uh, the imports and exports of everything. Um, and there is a branch of the universal loader that actually does do import address table fixups. It's called import address table. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you are uh, loading a library that depends on other libraries, uh, you'll definitely need to use the, uh, the IAT branch. Um, the OSX method uh, actually does use the system loader. Uh, we followed a training from Malware Unicorn, which I highly rec recommend checking out on uh, writing OSX malware. Um, and it actually finds where uh, the dynamic loader library is in memory and then uh, parses it with binject, uh, finds a couple of key functions in there that for some reason, for some reason, OSX is the only operating system that has a built-in part of the operating system that lets you load a library from RAM. Uh, both Windows and Linux require a file somewhere, but OSX does not. So we just, we just use that, oh, load a library from RAM method and you know, Bob's your uncle. So that's kind of why we're using the system loader uh, for OSX and no one else. And then the Linux method um, uh, does not use the system loader either, but it also does not use MFD. It really does a reflective uh, library load uh, for Linux. Uh, M MFD is a Linux uh, RAM disk, uh, and uh, the previous loaders for Golang just uh, dumped your uh, library to um, MFD and then uh, just loaded it with DL open. Um, we do not do that, uh, although it is easy and it works. Uh, use of MFD is unusual and it's easy to detect. Uh, so uh, doing an actual reflective library load is a bit stealthier, um, and that's what that's what we're doing. Um, so this is what it looks like in code. Uh, the interface, as I said, in code is the same for all operating systems. Basically, you got your library loaded in a buffer, and you, you make a new loader with new loader. Uh, you call loader.load library. That's the universal uh, loading your, your buffer as a library. And that will, under the hood, work differently uh, for whatever operating system you compile it for, but the interface remains the same. Uh, and then you can just call exported functions in it uh, with that library.call. Uh, in this example, we're calling a function called run me. We're passing it the argument seven. Uh, so this is just a super simple example, but it, it's going to be exactly like this uh, for every operating system. The only thing that'll change is the, the library that you actually load. So uh, a couple of notes. Um, uh, because you're not using the system loader, the, the libraries that you're dependent on will not automatically be loaded for you. So for Windows, you have to use the IAT branch, as I said. But then every library that you depend on, uh, you have to call syscall.mustloaddll uh, for that library to make sure that it's already loaded and present for you uh, before you use Universal. Um, but it'll automatically work it out from there. And uh, for Linux, um, I would just recommend that you statically compile the libraries you need to load with Universal, because uh, you can do that for Linux. It doesn't really work for Windows. Um, but if you just statically compile the library, like that'll just work fine, and it's easy. All right, moving on uh, to our next tool, it's Donut. Donut is amazing. Uh, it is a payload creation framework uh, that lets you convert any executable, uh, DLL, .NET assembly, uh, or like VBS, to an encrypted injectable shellcode. Uh, and then it is also the, the assembly loader uh, that decrypts and loads those payloads into a process. It is very configurable, uh, definitely check it out. Um, uh, one of its cool features uh, is that it supports remote loads. So you can actually configure the loader to pull down the rest of the payload from a web server instead of having to, to bundle it in, uh, which is pretty sick. Um, and uh, so I ported the utility that converts things to donut payloads to Go so that you can use it from an implant or from a C2. Uh, and you might be wondering why would you want to do this? Uh, we were, we'll see an example in a minute. Uh, it turns out to be a surprisingly handy thing to do. And because it's pure Go, uh, you can now do this from any operating system. Um, so most people's C2s are on Linux, not Windows. Uh, so that comes in handy. 
So a note, uh, you could use both universal or donut as a, as a module system for your implant. So a note on why you might want to do one or the other. Um, so basically, uh, donuts, you can make run in a, in a, in a process all by themselves. Uh, universal will try and load a library in your current process. There are a few situations that will break universal, uh, because there are things that don't like running, not on the main thread. For example, Mimi cats, uh, starts up some com hosting stuff that doesn't work right if it's not on the main thread. Um, so it, I don't think it's ever going to work right in universal, uh, which means, uh, but it works fine through donut as we'll see. Um, and, uh, there's also a go scheduler bug that's linked. And, um, so you can, uh, often run into problems if you try and load two go runtimes in the same thread. So if you're loading, uh, another go program with universal, uh, you might be better off with donut instead, uh, just to avoid, although it is possible, um, it is easier to avoid having two, uh, runtimes in one, uh, process. Um, and uh, so you can just use Donut instead of Universal in, th in that situation. There's another payload creation framework called Scarecrow, which is very popular um, and definitely worth checking out. It does some uh, kind of funny stuff. Um, it signs its loader uh, using Limelighter, as we mentioned before. Uh, even if you don't give it a cert, it'll, it'll just sign it anyway as a, a way of reducing EDR signal. And it's kind of unique and most badass feature is that it implements, uh, it disables the Windows Event Toolkit, which a lot of uh, EDRs uh, rely on, uh, by unhooking itself uh, in memory from EDR, uh, or sorry, from ETW, uh, which is super cool and worth uh, checking out. Um, and this is open source too, so that's like um, uh, code worth stealing, uh, or just use Scarecrow, a lot of people do. Um, so now, Banana phone, I almost put in the core components category. Uh, it is so cool and so important and so awesome for EDR evasion. Uh, it is an implementation of Hell's Gate or direct system calls uh, in Go. Um, there's a link to the original paper here, but basically what that means, there are stubs in NTDLL uh, that uh, everything is in Windows is compiled to use that then in turn call system calls. Um, but those stubs in NTDLL are commonly hooked or monitored by um, uh, EDR, uh, and so you can just uh, parse NTDLL because it's already loaded in your process, I guarantee. So you can look at your own process memory, look at NTDLL, um, uh, figure out where those direct system calls go, set up a call frame yourself, and just call them directly and not bother going through NTDLL, thus avoiding hooks. That's what Hell's Gate is. So Banana Phone is a completely transparent implementation of Hell's Gate. It's very easy to port existing Go code that uses syscall to banana phone because Sisto uh, was kind enough to uh, make a version of the make win syscall utility that converts uh, headers to uh, Go stubs. He made a version of that called make direct win syscall, uh, which converts headers to hell's gated uh, Go stubs. And it works exactly the same way as syscall. So it's just mad easy to convert syscall code over. Highly recommend doing that. It also has uh, a unique improvement over traditional Hell's Gate, found kind of by accident, um, but uh, there's a, an auto mode will actually detect when your in-memory NTDLL has been hooked by EDR and automatically fall back to reloading a, a fresh copy of NTLL from disk. Instead of the hooked version, the one on disk will not be hooked. And you can parse the one on disk uh, to, to figure out where the, to make the direct syscalls to, and it works just as well. And although this creates theoretically uh, more signal because loading another copy of NTDLL is sketchy, um, in practice, this actually works pretty well. Uh, it, it works on one of the more popular EDRs uh, without triggering anything. Um, so that's kind of neat. Uh, there's, there's also an implementation of Heaven's Gate in Go uh, called Go for Heaven. And this is another EDR evasion technique uh, where you call 64-bit uh, code from 32-bit code because nobody is expecting 32-bit code, boy. Um, and so this is pretty slick. Um, and this also has a really great example of 32-bit 386 uh, Go assembly um, in case you need that for some reason. This is one of the few examples uh, that, that works. All right. Um, so we've gone over a bunch of EDR uh, evasion and NIDS evasion tools. Uh, let's go on to post-exploitation, uh, which is super fun because it's the loot. 
So go Mimi Cats. Uh, basically, this combines Go Donut and Banana Phone. Uh, it downloads Mimi Cats to memory, makes it into a donut payload, injects it into itself, into its own process with Banana Phone system calls, and it lets you run Mimi Cats on systems where you really shouldn't be able to. The whole program is 150 lines of code. This is the best example of Banana Phone and Go Donut. Um, there's the Go Donut bit up top, the Banana Phone bit down bottom. I couldn't fit 150 lines in a slide, but uh, you can pull it up on a browser. I made a quick demo. I cross compiled Go Mimi Cats um to to windows md64 that's all you have to do to cross compile and go by the way super easy i copied it to an smb share with the name gm exe i did not garble it uh, and i set up a win 10 edge uh let it update defenders enabled i'm running from smb and uh i got the little like uh, uh proof strings up and then i just run it and bam mimi cats runs nothing flags and i can interact with it which is just crazy so that's current Mimi Cats, current Win 10 Edge. Um, you will get caught by behavioral stuff once you start doing stuff in Mimi Cats. So you will have to do some other trickery to avoid the behavioral detections. There's another utility worth checking out from Virus uh, called MSF Lib, which uh, makes your implants work with Metasploit. It has all of the like Metasploit URL generation magic. Um, it also uses banana phone. It also has code to run a payload in the current process or inject a payload into a remote process. Very cool, very worth checking out. Uh, writing a Windows service in Go can be a little bit of a pain in the ass. There's a, an example link there. Um, but uh, Captain Spacehook has made the Taskmaster utility that a, a lot of people use to interact with the Windows task scheduler as a method of persistence. Um, to avoid having to create a Windows service. You can just schedule a task to run your thing periodically. Definitely check that out. Gscript is a whole other talk. There was a DEF CON 26 talk on it. It, it, it. it uses an embedded JavaScript interpreter to make a scripting language for droppers. There's like a thousand sample Gscripts in Oz uh, Gscript repo that do things like disable AV, EDR, firewalls. You can make registry changes. You can set up persistence. You can do all kinds of things. Um, so definitely check out Gscript. It's a, a completely other, you know, hour long talk. Uh, another tool from Sisto uh, for dit dumping. This is another thing that Impacket does, uh, but Impacket in Python is very slow. It takes hours to dump a dit. Um, Sisto's tool can do it in minutes. Um, definitely check that out uh, if you want to dump hashes from a dit. And the old lasagna tool that steals uh, browser passwords, mail passwords, all kinds of passwords. It's been parted to go. Uh, Go is on you. However, it does require uh, CGO, which means you need to set up an external C compiler. However, the only reason it needs CGO is because of a dependency on SQLite because the browser password databases are SQLite databases. But there is now a pure Go implementation of SQLite, uh, which I've linked. Um, so someone someday will uh, modify uh, Go lasagna to no longer require uh, CGO, and that would be lovely. Thank you. Uh, there's a few other uh, post-exploitation tools you should check out, including uh, PseudoFisher, which is hilarious, uh, from Audible Blink. Uh, that actually is an ask pass replacement that will log the uh, pseudo password. So that's just like a, a funny thing to do. Uh, and also our clone is just a utility to uh, loot things from cloud storage. Um, so those may come in handy. And then we have a couple of complete C2 frameworks entirely implemented in Go. Uh, the heavy hitter in the space is Sliver, which is an open source alternative to Cobalt Strike. It's coming along, it's under active development. Um, it's designed to be use, used by a team. So the, the C2 um, is multi-user, multi-operator, which is pretty awesome. It has a huge list of features. It has an implant build and obfuscate framework. Um, uh, there's so much in there uh, I don't have time to go into. Definitely check out the wiki on their GitHub for instructions on how to set it up. And check out the dev branches because they have a lot of uh, really cool stuff uh, cooking. Um, and peer pressure them into doing their own DEF CON talk at some point. <laughs> uh, another C2 framework uh, definitely worth mentioning is Merlin. Uh, the only downside of Merlin is that a uh, single operator, single operator, uh, but it has some unique fe features that are not really in anything else. Uh, it supports a ton of injection methods, but the one that, uh, that sticks out is it has an implementation in Go of Q user APC. Um, definitely worth checking that out. Uh, it also has integration with Donut and another common loader, which is SRDI. Uh, and it does support many C2 protocols also like Sliver, uh, but it has quick support, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that's my time. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
As a reminder, I do host a podcast called Hack the Planet, and uh, there are a few uh, interviews we've done on Hack the Planet relevant to this talk. We have an interview with Josh Pitts, which is phenomenal, the, the author of Ebola and uh, the, the original Backdoor Factory. Uh, and we have another episode entirely on Golang Malware uh, featuring uh, Sisto and Captain Spacehook, uh, the authors of some of the utilities uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, bye, DEF CON 29. Um, and uh, I hope I gave you uh, some ideas uh, for writing Golang Malware or even you know, improving detections or reversing for Golang Malware. Thank you.